Most people know me for NumPy. NumPy became much more popular because it's more generic, it does more. But the story really starts with sci-fi and it really started in that 1999 time frame. I would say it started with a little module I wrote called NumPy IO. I just needed to load medical imaging data files. So there's this DICOM format, and I was part of a research lab at the Mayo Clinic that was doing a project called Analyze. Analyze was a software that took different data sets and it could run on multiple machines, and it let researchers manipulate those data in three dimensions. I was trying to extend it, I was trying to use Python to do similar kinds of activities. So how do I do that? Well, I could write an extension for Python to read that, those data. A guy named Michael Miller had written a project called Table.io, and he made it open source. So he just published his work and I could see it, download it, very liberally licensed, didn't have any kind of stipulation that if he used it, I had to do something and send my firstborn child or you know, send him letters or anything. I could just use it, took Table.io, modified it, and released NumPy.io. That was my very first open source module. I put out in the net, I made a little web page, really ugly looking web page. And I said, here's NumPy.io. If you want to read any data, here it is. And uh, I got some feedback on it and it was amazing. It started that trend. That was the very first thing that got me, that educated me how to do it. It wasn't super popular with a lot of people, but then later I started needing more things like, oh, I need to be able to solve block equations for my MRI simulator. And so, oh, where do I get that? I found ODE Pack. It's a Fortran library. So I just wrapped it into Python, made it available and pushed that out on the, on the world and called it ODE Pack. Then I did a Fortran integration, Quad Pack, and I did a special functions library called it CFIS. I mean, I just did a series of independent modules because Python was extensible, because you extend it with native code, in this case, Fortran libraries that I integrated to Python. I just basically by, in 1999, ended up with the six or seven different packages that I put out there as different modules. They were pulled together in something called multi-pack. Very generic, not much brand awareness. By start of the year 2000, we had kind of a growing collection of tools that somebody could use for science, but they were hard to get. There were all these different modules, you had to pull them together. And then a high school student named Robert, Robert Kern, actually, uh, I didn't know he was a high school student at the time, actually. What he did though, is he said, oh, here's some interesting scientific modules, let me take them. And he built Windows installers for them, which was a lot of work. And he said, hey, here's the multi-pack distribution on a Windows EXE, you can just, just click here and install it. Well, as soon as that became available, the number of users of multi-pack went up by a factor of 100. All of a sudden, a lot more people started using the software. And so that was like, oh yeah, I guess distribution matters. I guess making it easy to install matters. Of course it does, but you know, I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about sharing my work with scientists. Eventually, a man contacted me by the name of Eric Jones. Eric Jones was a researcher at Duke at the time, and he had written a few other modules. He was working on a multiple problem with Fortran code, so he was one of the people that started to use these tools for his own research, and then said, hey, there's an opportunity here. He and his friend started a company called Enthought at the time, and they wanted to also create this ecosystem of scientific libraries and pull them together. And so we, we organized the SciPy library in 2001. Really, SciPy was kind of a distribution of Python modules, trying to make it easy for somebody who's a researcher to get all the stuff installed, start using it, and we did it as a single library, but it really was a distribution of Python masquerading as a single library. It was also an ecosystem. So SciPy.org was created, and on SciPy.org, it became kind of a focal point, kind of a gathering point for the scientific ecosystem in Python. And then particularly what helped is a conference series was started in 2001. The story of NumPy really starts at that SciPy conference as well. About the time of 2001, the folks from the Hubble Space Science Telescope had adopted Python through their image processing of the images coming back from the satellite. But the array at the time was something called numeric, and it was written by Jim Huguenin, who was a grad student at the time at MIT, and SciPy was basically built using numeric arrays. So all the arrays in SciPy were numeric arrays. So it was getting a large number of dependencies. A lot of people were using numeric. I was, I was quite, I was quite familiar with numeric, but the folks at, at, science, at the Space Science Telescope needed more from the array. They uh, needed, needed them to be faster and they're small, faster when they're bigger, they needed better scale, they needed, um, to be able to update them differently. They needed to have fancy indexing. They needed to have certain capabilities that weren't available. They needed things to be improved in numeric. And so they had started work on their own array library called NumArray. About 2004, uh, a project came out called ND Image. 
in the image was a really interesting uh, library, especially for somebody trained in medical imaging like I was. And the image had tools for medical scientists, medical imaging scientists that I wanted. I wanted in SciPy, but he had written them. Very well done, actually. It's a very nice library, but it used Numeray. And so all of a sudden I'm seeing a world where, oh wait, SciPy is here with its libraries built on numeric. And now there's this really good library and others going to follow suit that use Numeray. And now we have this split ecosystem. So we have kind of a divided world. And the challenge at the time was the data couldn't be shared. So once you had your data in a num array, you'd have to copy it out into a numeric array in order to use it for SciPy. So all of a sudden, you know, if you want to mix and match these two array libraries, you'd be having potentially multiple copies of the same data in memory. I started using Python because I was concerned about memory. If you're doing large amounts of data for image processing, volume processing, you can have gigabytes of data. I was a professor, third year, they have a review, do a get tenure, you're on the right track. And the review came back and said, yeah, you're doing okay, but you're spending a lot of time on this open source stuff and maybe you should spend less time on that and more time on getting grants and writing papers. <laughs> so I just received that from my department chair. Essentially, a few months later, I started to write NumPy. <laughs> Why? Because I saw this split and I was like, this is not good. This is gonna mean that we can't cooperate as easily and we'll have, we, we need to kind of come together. And I went, well, who can help do this? Because I talked to a few people about it, like, hey, how do we get on the same page? And lots of people were willing. Like talk is, everyone will talk the same way. Everyone agrees to do stuff, talking. But actually doing is a lot more rare, actually. Eventually I was like, well, I think I'm one of the few people in the world that can do this because I know numeric really well. I know number A, I, I could. I had a light teaching load one, one semester where I had just a research class I was teaching and that class fell through. So I essentially had no class teaching load and I went, oh, well, maybe I can do this. And so maybe I can write a NumPy that is takes numeric, adds the features of NumRay and unites the communities. For the first six months, pretty much, um, I just had to, I was just myself doing a lot of work to try to, okay, how do I do this? How do I actually get the features? How do I build big fancy indexing work? There's a lot of stuff and it was stretching me. It was stretching me from a algorithmic perspective. It was stretching me from a, a computer science perspective. It was fun. It was amazing. Um, but there were a lot of things I really wished I'd had some adult supervision, so to speak. Uh, somebody with some more experience to kind of help guide some of the decisions. Uh, there were some decisions made and some of those I made, some of those were made in conjunction with others that came to the project later. We just made the bad, so we just made the wrong decision. That's going to happen, I guess, but this is where the more input you have, the more experience you have, the more you can avoid some of those um, later obvious decisions. I mean, some decisions you wouldn't have known, they're the unknown unknowns, things that you wouldn't have, couldn't have possibly known. But I'm talking about things that were knowable. Things that were knowable if we'd had the right information from elsewhere. That, those are the part that I'm particularly like, ah, oh, that's, that's a shame. It would have been nice if we would have had better input at that point. So about six to eight months it took me to write the first kind of alpha release of NumPy. It takes another year to harden it, <laughs> to actually get to where it's ready to actually publicly release as a version one. But about four months in, I started to get some people going, oh, he's serious, this is gonna happen. And they started to help. Got a lot of help from Robert Kern, got a lot of help from Charles Harris. One of the challenges of NumPy is because it is a hybrid uh, library that's built from an existing code base numeric and added on features from another. And then furthermore, it had to support the user bases of both. I had to take numeric users, and now SciPy was a massive numeric user, so I had a benefit of like, if SciPy could do it, anybody else could do it too. And so I, but I also had to support numeric users like IndieImage. So help it so they, and they had C code, and the C code had, had, a, had a C APIs that were mirroring those C APIs they were used to calling, and they would call into a, a fundamental structure. So it was this hybrid that was merging two groups. It was, that was the hardest part, actually. That that's took about a year to, to, fit, to fix. So for the next year and a half, basically, I, I spent a lot of time on NumPy, trying to get the first version working, get a lot of people together but it really paid off, it really paid off. Yes, turned out my academic career didn't flourish. That's why when it came, you know, three years later to my academic uh, tenure application, I didn't get it. I got um, told to come back and we'll try again. Even though it was pretty clear NumPy was successful by then, it was still, you know, not as clear to everybody in the department. Um, but it, it, it's been my most wildly successful contribution of anything I've ever done. When I knew NumPy would be successful is when I went to the SciPy conference 
and demoed it. And actually when I finished my presentation, I got a standing ovation at Caltech from about a hundred of my scientific peers, right? And never had that before or since, <laughs> never had that. And it was one of those moments in life when you're like, oh yeah, I knew this was important, but I could see that it was important. And the reason NumPy succeeded again, not just because of me, I did a lot of work to get it started, but these other people started to come help. And as they started to come help, I could see, yes, okay, this is working. And other people started to help. And now today, NumPy is maintained by many, many other people, not me.